Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for the Southeast Asia Lecture Series sponsored by the Asia Center at Harvard University. I'm Annette Lee now, an Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard. It's my great privilege to be welcoming our speaker today, John Rusa, who is an Associate Professor of History at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Professor Rusa is a historian of Indonesia and the author of two groundbreaking books, Pretext for Mass Murder, the September 30th Movement and Suharto's Coup d'etat in Indonesia, in, published in 2006, and Buried Histories, the Anti-Communist Massac Massacres in Indonesia, 1965 to 1966, published in 2020 with the University of Wisconsin Press. Professor Rusa, uh, his presentation today um, is entitled Some Methodological Notes on Writing about the massacres of 1965 to 1966 in Indonesia. It's also my pleasure to introduce our respondent for today's talk, Elsa Klave, who's also a historian of Southeast Asia. Professor Klave is a current associate of Harvard's Asia Center this year. She's a junior professor at the University of Hamburg, uh, Hamburg's uh, Asian Africa Institute and an associate research researcher at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the EHESS CNRS in France. Her current research project examines the literature of Indonesian exiles across Asia after the 1965 um, and 1966 massacres, uh, focusing on diasporic writing in China, Korea, and Vietnam. She's also just published a book released through the Ecole Française d'Extrême Orient on the cultural history of Islam in the Southern Philippines. I'm also pleased to be joined by my colleague at the Harvard Business School, uh, Matthias Fibiger, who will be co-moderating the Q&A. Um, Professor Fibiger is also a historian of Southeast Asia with projects on political and economic history and international diplomacy in Southeast Asia and a forthcoming first book entitled Suharto's Cold War, Indonesia, Southeast Asia and the World. Uh, Professor Rusa's presentation will be around 20 minutes, followed by a brief response from Professor Clave before we open the floor to questions. Because we have a large number of participants for this event, I ask that you please use the Q&A um, channel to submit questions, which we'll be reading aloud and presenting to Professor Rusa uh, towards the end of the hour. Thank you very much. And with that, I'll pass the floor to Professor Rusa. <clears throat> thank you so much, Anna, and thanks for the invitation uh, to present today. At the uh, University of British Columbia, we begin events with a land acknowledgement as to where we're speaking from, and um, I'm speaking from um, the traditional unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, this is in what is known as Vancouver area. So for today's talk, I'm going to be presenting not the book's arguments. I'm not going to be going through the book Buried Histories, um, but I want to indicate some of the ideas I had in mind when writing it, sort of a behind the scenes approach, and to bring out some themes that um, some of which are not um, you know, it made explicit in the text itself. So uh, some of you may know my earlier book, The Pretext for Mass Murder, which was focused on a single event, the September 30th movement. And the message of that book was paradoxical. The book contained a lengthy detailed analysis of that one event, only to demonstrate that the event wasn't really all that important. So I was kind of working at cross purposes uh, in that book. Um, the September 30th movement was a small scale conspiratorial action that collapsed only hours after it, after it, it had begun. Some readers came away with that message that it was a small scale event and we can move on to other more important events. Um, but others inevitably, and this was just in the nature of the, the book itself, um, continued to be sort of attracted to this problem as to what the September 30th movement was, who was behind it. And, and so it generated more discussions about the September 30th movement. 
So that was a, a kind of paradox going on in, in that book. And my latest book, Buried Histories, has a similar kind of problem. Um, it focuses on the mass murder for which the September 30th movement was the pretext. But I'm acutely conscious of the fact that a book about violence in Indonesia with the word massacre in the title runs the risk of confirming longstanding prejudices for much of the reading public in the US, Canada, uh, and Europe. Many people already have the impression that violence is only natural in what they assume to be a strange and backward third world country that they know very little about. The massacres of 1965, 66 seem to signify another sad and pitiful story for society that's assumed to be mired in poverty and ignorance that's fit only for charity. And in my dealings over the years with academics who specialize in the history of Europe, the US, and Canada, I think many of them expect that um, a history from Southeast Asia you know, should be full of mass violence. That's the kind of story that they've heard before with uh, the Vietnam War uh, and Cambo the Cambodian genocide. And so and so I'm, I'm actually trying to work against that. While writing about violence, I'm actually trying to indicate other things going on in that society that I'll, I'll get to. Um, and as you know, many one of the few reference points for people in the West about Indonesia is this, 19, um, um, is this film, The Year of Living Dangerously, that came out in 1982 to rave reviews. It starred Mel Gibson and Sigourney Weaver and its basic message, one could complicate this story, but I think it's the basic message is that Indonesians are a mystical and scrutable people whose political life is a hopeless, violent mess. And the best thing for a white couple to do is to enjoy their own sexual pleasures and get the next KLM flight out of Jakarta. So again, you, know, you might have different uh, takes on that film, but I think uh, um, that's mine. Um, so I'm also writing for an Indonesian audience there are far more readers of my books inside Indonesia than outside. And as you know, there, uh, communists are, are demonized. The mainstream opinion treats the killing of communists as acceptable, um, even uh, laudable. So how does one write about violence in this context for these kinds of audiences that don't see the massacres as problems that need to be studied? Uh, when writing about victims who are not considered to be uh, victims or not considered to be uh, deserving victims, vic victims deserving of any concern. So I don't think we should just ignore the violence. I do think we have to tarry with the negative, especially when uh, the existing understandings of the massacres have been shaped by the perpetrators, by the need to hide, deny, or misrepresent what they did. So I think it would be an injustice to um, allow these versions of events to stand unchallenged and un unrefuted. Versions that have made their way into scholarly accounts of Indonesian history, such as those by Clifford Gertz and Merle Rickleffs. There are many Indonesians who want to understand the events in more detail and are disturbed by the casual dismissals the fossilized apologetics and the occasional grotesque justifications. One way to avoid confirming these prejudices about the violent societies in the third world, quote unquote violent societies in the third world is to universalize the story, to de-exceptionalize it by bringing in the role of the United States. Uh, the left, Noam Chomsky for in instance, has been very good on this point by emphasizing the um, encouragement and material assistance that the US provided to the Indonesian army while it was committing the genocide. I didn't feel the need to make that theme front and center in the book that has been done by others. And my earlier book uh, discusses the US involvement. I really wanted to make this a book about the subjectivity of Indonesians themselves. And I wanted readers to feel the tragedy of the killing in ways that I did myself when researching and writing about it. Uh, many of the existing scholarly analysis on the killings are, I think, overly analytical, and that they don't move the reader. 
and they follow a tradition of human rights reporting that largely expunges an engagement with emotions. So I wanted to write uh, about these personal stories, about individuals with names, characteristics, with ideals and aspirations and accomplishments before the violence began. So I'm going to start the, the PowerPoint to um, explain certain uh, themes of, sort of how I'm approaching this um, uh, trying to reach this goal of dealing with the, um, the representations of the victims. So um, the typical way that many Indonesians have, many Indonesian human rights activists have used to gain sympathy for the victims of 1965-66 is to claim that the victims weren't really communists. This is a theme in much of the fictional literature as well that tries to represent the tragedy. Um, they were victimized due to personal vendettas, mistaken identities, bureaucratic bumbling. They weren't, the victims weren't really committed to the PKI. They were ordinary people and so forth. And, uh, with the assumption that if people had been fully committed members of the PKI, the violence against them would have been okay. So I didn't want to follow that approach. And so what I did instead was to um, talk about the PKI directly and to bring in the history of the PKI into the story. And I'm making a, a couple um, points at least about the history of the Communist Party, the PKI. Um, one is that the PKI was rooted in the labor movement and that the destruction of the PKI meant the destruction of working class power. And that I think is a tragedy. Um, this is an image of the union hall of the railway workers, the SPKA, the Sarikat Buru Kreta Api, Union Hall that the workers themselves built in the early 1950s, soon after independence, uh, using their own money and volunteer labor. Uh, this is what it looks like today, or as of last year, from Google Street Map. Uh, it's a warehouse. It was the building was taken by the um, the military and confiscated. And uh, it wound up now in the hands of a company using it as a, a warehouse. And this is a photo I took of it about 10 years ago when visiting. It was still used as a, a, as a warehouse and for a cargo company then. So this had been the center of cultural life for the left in Jakarta. And uh, this is a photo from the Wehai Jun collection that the Indonesian Institute of Social History has. These are photographs taken by the uh, PKI uh, leader, Wehai Jun, uh, photos that were amazingly maintained and not destroyed by his wife, Jane. Um, you know, kind of heroic act of resistance. As many of the victims destroyed the photographs that they had for fear that they would be uh, used as evidence. And uh, people did not want to associate themselves with the PKI, have any proof that they were part of the PKI. Um, this is the 35th anniversary of the PKI in 1955 held in that union hall. This is the inside of the hall. And the photograph is not that great of a quality and I was worried that it wouldn't appear in the book, but the publisher managed to do a, a good job of, of, of um, using, of bringing it out. Um, and 
I, I like the photograph for indicating the, the smaller scale of the PKI celebrations because we're all familiar with the 1945 celebrations, which were in the stadium, which involved many, many more people. But the PKI's roots um, are really in the, um, uh, the, the labor movement. And uh, the Railway Workers Union was a, uh, was a key part of the trade union federation that um, was well organized, long history behind it, and had been very um, important in the independent struggle too, and controlling the railways um, uh, in the late 1940s. So, so this, these are, I wanted to bring out these stories about. Um, the labor movement and the destruction of, uh, the, of, of unions, of independent unions. Um, and the, another point I wanted to make about the history of the PKI is that you know, for whatever the rhetoric about world revolution and Stalin and Lenin, the PKI in Indonesia largely functioned as a social democratic party. It was, um, trying to work out cross-class alliances uh, within a popular front policy, operating within existing state structures. And chapter four of the book is a history of the PKI in the area around Solo in central Java, um, where it was by far the most popular party in the 1955 elections. And it won the districts around in Solo and around it um, by landslides. And I wanted to try to explain something about why the PKI was so popular there. And this is a, a photo also from the Wehai Jun collection of the head of Lekra, Jubra Ayub, um, opening their first national Congress. And they chose Solo as the place for it because it was, the PKI was so popular there. It was just a mainstream party. This is the audience for that event. And uh, you can look at the lower right-hand corner. Uh, that's the mayor of Solo, Utoma Ramalan. And this is a kind of close-up of that scene. That's uh, Utoma Ramalan on the left. And then Sukarno is, is there in the middle looking to the side. Um, this was, <laughs> this is the PKI in action. It's uh, when running the city of Solo, it was trying to maintain social peace. It wasn't all that revolutionary. It's the PKI did not consist of a bunch of wild eyed radicals. They were trying to be respectable people within the prevailing norms of Indonesian nationalism. They weren't that powerful on the national level and where they were powerful, as in Solo, um, they were trying to maintain social peace. They, and that kind of understanding of the PKI helps us to you know, appreciate just how uh, horrific the killings were. Um, the book aims to denaturalize the killings, to show that they were inexcusable. I threw this photo in also from the Weihai Jun collection, just because it's an unusual, it's a kind of a rare photo of the PKI leaders in, the, in their headquarters um, in Jalan Krama in Jakarta, and to see them in a lighthearted mood. <laughs> statue of Lenin in the background. Um, so um, uh, one of the themes in the book is to show that there were many Indonesians who were opposed to the killings. So this is another way of denaturalizing it. Um, that there were uh, army officers loyal to President Sukarno who tried to stop the killings from happening or to limit them once they began. And one chapter discusses one of those officers, uh, the Kodam commander based in Bali, Brigadier General Safiuddin. Uh, this photo didn't make it into the book. Uh, it's the quality is not very good. It's from a, um, 
newspaper actually published by the uh, a magazine published by the Presidential Guard in the uh, early 1960s. They had some money to finance um, <clears throat> uh, this, uh, their own magazine. Um, so there were army officers who did not agree with the policy of killing PKI supporters and um, they were trying to, uh, they were, they were meant to be perpetrators, that they were put in this position where they're supposed to be perpetrators and they refused. And it's, it's one form of resistance. There's other forms of resistance that one can, um, that occurred, but this is, this is, I think, an important form. And, and to some extent that actually determines the pattern of the killing as well and the timing as well as to when the army officers in charge of the army's territorial command were um, approving of this policy of killing the PKI supporters. The repression could have been limited to mass arrests and mass incarceration that would have its own human rights implications, but it would have been better than what it turned out to be, which was the mass killing of prisoners. So bringing out this distinction between the, the different forms of repression, again, helps us to denaturalize the killings, to realize that they were unnecessary, that they could have easily not have happened. And in some places in Indonesia, they didn't happen. The resistance was not just from top level officers like Safiuddin, but also from, uh, goes all the way down to village heads. There's another story in the book about a village head in Bali who thought that uh, the killings were wrong and he was trying to protect the PKI supporters uh, in his village until he, like Zafiruddin, was overwhelmed. Um, so uh, the killing was, I think, entirely unnecessary, that there, there wasn't any justification for it. Um, so um, I use uh, some paintings to indicate this as well, to indicate that this was really taking prisoners out at night, um, and usually at night, but taking prisoners out and killing them by the truckload. And you notice the truck in the back of the, this painting. Uh, Miss Baktamran was a political prisoner in uh, Kalimantan, and this is a painting of a story that he uh, heard about a son and his, uh, and his father. The, um, he himself witnessed other forms, other, other kinds of extrajudicial executions, but this, he wanted to portray this one because it was particularly poignant. Um, a son saying goodbye to his father because his father's name has been called and to be taken out and put on a truck and disappeared. Um, this also gets to the question of the resistance from the victims as to why there was so little resistance from the victims. Um, when they were already captive in prison, it was very, very difficult for them to resist and their attitude um, was one of resignation, a feeling of pasra, of not being able to do anything um, in that uh, situation. In other cases, they did, they did have room for resistance and they, they did that. But, so um, this is, you know, there's a kind of theme in the book of trucks. Um, there's images of trucks throughout and something uh, my colleague uh, who works on the killings from another angle from the statistical side, uh, Siddharth Chandra has done work on as well on, on the trucks. Um, 
so this is the painting on the cover. It's also with the trucks there. Um, I'm indicating that these were disappearances. These were prisoners being taken out, sometimes blindfolded as they were in this painting by Joko Piquet, who was also an uh, ex-political prisoner. Uh, usually their hands tied up, put into trucks, taken off and killed somewhere and buried in a mass grave that was left unmarked or disappeared, that this is a common form of killing. And here's the sort of dialectic between the analysis and the, the and effect. And that is the, you know, once you recognize that this is indeed the, the way in which um, many, if not most of the victims were killed, then you can easily recognize just the, how unnecessary it was, that, that how wasteful of human life it was, how um, uh, inexcusable it was. Um, another uh, theme in the book that uh, um, is to indicate, um, to show Indonesians mourning, to show Indonesians honoring the dead. <clears throat> um, this says to help us to reorient how we approach the killings themselves by taking it out of the event itself and dealing with the aftermath. <coughs> sure. um, these are a group of um, the PKI staff from Jakarta who were with uh, Wehai Jun when he was passing through uh, central Java and they stopped at uh, this village of uh, Malihan uh, where 11 PKI leaders were killed in like, December 1948, extrajudicial uh, executions. And they stopped by the graves and tended to them to clean it up. And this is in the early 1960s. We don't know the exact date of it. Um, this is a still from the film, um, The Look of Silence. This is the grave of Romley, who's the sort of central figure in the film, who is the um, son who was killed, who, if you remember, um, would have been disappeared if, if he had escaped. This is a case of resistance as they captives were being led to the river to be executed, he escaped, uh, but he was caught later in the plantation area and killed there. And that's why there's a grave for him. But most of the others were, were lost or, or disappeared and their bodies have never been found. But Romley's killing was known about um, that specific, you know, that, that this was the place where Romley was, was killed. And the book ends with this photo, which <clears throat> unfortunately appears in the book in black and white. Um, you don't get the, the quality, the full quality of it. It's a, it's a striking photo about the, the efforts to, uh, up in Samarang, just outside of Samarang, uh, to install this plaque at a place where there was a mass grave. And I think that is a very heroic story of human rights activists in the Samarang area and historians um, documenting as best they could what had happened and to honor those who had been killed there. And just marking it, in the Indonesian context was a major accomplishment that had, uh, for which they faced many, many hurdles uh, to achieve. And in chapter four about Solo, there's this discussion of an event in 2005 to honor the victims um, who had been killed on this bridge uh, in 65, 66. Many people from Solo in the area gathered to um, have a funeral ceremony for the, the victims. 
And um, in Bali as well, uh, there's a story in, um, about a man who's honored his father, who was the um, leader of a Legong troop uh, with these statues of, uh, of musicians to represent his father and his, um, uh, his fellow musicians. And <clears throat> there's a brief description in the book about this um, art installation in 1994. This was actually the first time I came to Indonesia. It was my first trip to Indonesia. And we went to Tim, you all know, I'm sure, the Taman Ismail Marzuki in Jakarta and the artist Samsar had taken over this unused pavilion and brought in a backhoe and dug up <laughs> this, um, this pit and then carved out of the mud, sculpted out of the mud, these figures at the bottom. Um, and at night, that this is what it looked like. And so it was a, a kind of, it's meant to shock, I think, viewers, but uh, there was also an attempt by some sort to kind of honor uh, the dead as well. He was thinking not just of 65, 66, but of many other cases of violence from Aceh was um, uh, an important case for him. And um, he was from North Sumatra. And uh, <clears throat> that was, the violence was going on there uh, in the early 1990s. Um, so this was a kind of another way that some sort of had of, um, of honoring the dead. And so that, that's, those are the uh, themes, uh, some of the, the methods I had, some of the ideas I had when writing the book about you know, politicizing the story, not just making it a human rights account um, of who did what to whom, but to bring in the history of the PKI, just to indicate that uh, they were uh, just as virtuous as anybody else in Indonesia, to bring out the ways in which Indonesians at the time resisted the genocide, um, and also to uh, highlight this theme of mourning and honoring the dead. So I'll stop there and. Uh, Take, uh, I'm for, looking forward to hearing from uh, Elsa's comments and from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I encourage anyone who has questions to please submit them through the Q&A channel, uh, which uh, you can find access to at the bottom of, uh, of the bottom panel of the Zoom uh, window. Um, with that, thank you so much to Elsa for her response. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Annette, and thank you, John, for your, your presentation. Um, so you, you did uh, a brilliant presentation in 25 minutes, summarizing uh, more than uh, uh, two decades of research. And, um, and you presented a few, a few themes uh, that are important in, in your last book. So what I will uh, now give is a, is a very personal reading, I mean, personal impression of, of the reading of your book, and, uh, and also an answer to what you um, you just uh, um, presented. Um, so you asked the question, um, how does one write about violence when this, this violence is so accepted and so common? And um, I think the first, the first thing that you did is first you, you broke um, you know, the paradigm and you broke the dichotomy between um, what, what happened was ineluctable, what happened uh, should have happened and couldn't have been stopped. And you did that by looking at very local level and in a way that have not been done before because you selected four provinces. So you did not um, um, conduct um, research just in one locality, um, which had been done by other researchers in a brilliant way. You did not choose to have an hybrid view about the, the massacre which according to you, and I believe so, really covered a lot of detail, what you, you call variations. And I found these variations really, um, it, it's a key word for me to understand uh, your book. And I think um, that also 
uh, something that, that we should follow uh, through your, your book and your methods is how it has been important for you to, to highlight the different relationship between the different groups in the different provinces and to highlight how those relationships, those variations, those differences really uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, conducted or, or um, really directed um, the result of, of the massacre in each of the province. Um, so you had this attention for the detail and the variations. And um, I, I, we can see it as, as um, a method of a very meticulous historian, which I think is, is partly true, but we can also see this attention to detail and to variation as um, a need to really pay respect and attention to um, the very particular and private history of all the victims. Um, and I like your title, Buried Histories. And I really like in, I mean, your presentation with all the different uh, pictures and the different drawings, and also in the chapters that we really have this very close relation between the historian and I won't say, you know, the, the object of research because it's really, we can feel the relation that you have built during those 20 years with the people you interview with the loved ones um, that have been killed. And I think that's really, for me, um, the difference with the other work. Of course, all the research respect, at a particular respect for the victims and the survivors. But in your book, and I think in your presentation also, we can feel it. And um, we can feel in the writing this, this, this use of emotion. And I think you, you use it several times also, um, that there is a need for subjectivity that we need to, really to respect uh, the memory of the people and this insistence um, on the long-standing impact of the destruction of the PKI, but also on the long-standing impact of the destruction of the families and, and what it, uh, how it affects second and up to the third generation nowadays. It's something that I also find very important. And usually, at least in, in the literature that I've uh, read until now, it's always very, you know, separated. So you have literature about the victims, you have literature about the political events, you have literature about, um, which has a very local um, uh, focus, and, and another which has a very national focus. But in, in your book, you really uh, succeeded in, in having all those threads together, and um, which make it a very, very uh, good introduction book, so detailed, so deep, but in fact, very, intro very good um, reading as an introduction because we can feel all those very important layers in the history of 1965. The care for the victim, the long-standing impact, um, the need to have all those you know, case studies and, and you presented four, uh, but you could have presented 20 uh, if you had had the place. And I think that um, many more uh, needs to come. Um, and also, um, yeah, this, this um, variations that are so important and that are not just, you know, um, at least that's how I understood it, that you was not just insisting on the differences because historically that was important, but it was also because it was important to give back the place to the people who died and to the family, the place that have been taken from them, from the history, and to give a place to everybody, um, at least as much as possible. So that um, will be my few words on, um, on this book. And maybe I will now leave uh, space for question and answer. Thank you so much, Elsa. Um, uh, Professor Rusa John, if, if you would like to respond first, we can do that um, or, or go straight to the questions, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, I think, um, yeah, thank you also for those comments. and. Um, I, I won't say much. Um, I did uh, before I go on, I'll just mention one thing that there is a problem in the analysis of the killings in the book in that the two areas where the killing was the greatest, uh, was the most intense, uh, and claimed the largest number of victims was in North Sumatra and East Java. And I didn't write about those areas. And, um, as you said, the 
there needs to be a lot more study in, in these other areas. And so I was sort of, um, I, I wish that our research, the, my own research and that of my colleagues um, could have been better in those provinces, because I think that those are very important stories <clears throat> from, from those areas. But um, that is inevitably when one's trying to create the sort of national story that some places don't get covered. Um, but I do hope, as you said, that the book can provide a kind of um, a approach for how to conduct research or you know, one, one way of conducting research in, in other places. Thank you so much, uh, John, for sharing that and for um, your presentation and for fielding our many questions today. Um, thank you also to Elsa for joining us as, as respondent. Thanks to everyone for your questions and for your engagement. Um, I hope that you'll have occasion to join us for future events uh, through our Asia Center lecture series later this spring. We'll be featuring a panel soon in early April with Grace Lixana and Willan Irgantoro um, on activism, art, and third generation victims of 1965. And later, nearly coinciding with Kartini Day in Indonesia, an event featuring Intan Paramadita in April on feminist activism in arts and culture in Indonesia. Thank you so much to everyone again. Um.